This week on Waterways. Coral disease and the health of the Florida Keys Reef Tract. Just below the surface of the turquoise waters of the Florida Keys, there live armies of small animals called coral. Whether hard or soft, branching or rocky, the corals attach themselves to the calcified substrate created by their ancestors. Collectively, these coral colonies comprise the world's third largest bank barrier reef in the world and the only emergent reef ecosystem found off the continental United States. Coral reefs are called the rainforests of the sea due to their high biodiversity and threatened status. How do we know that the coral reefs are threatened? Where's the proof of the decline in live coral? For locals who know these reefs, the proof has been alarmingly obvious. We scientists are now demonstrating with scientific certainty what local guides and local fishermen have been telling us and the general public for a long time. And I'm here to tell you, they were right. I am not an alarmist, but you can't help. Every time you go out, you see less and less, and you realize that these effects are not like some other species. For example, if you overfish one year, the next year you may find the fish population has rebounded. These corals live for decades or centuries. And when we lose a coral that's one or two centuries old, it takes one or two centuries to replace it. But what did the reefs look like a couple of years ago? And how have they changed? The first step in protecting this resource is to make an assessment. This means determining what exists and how it is changing. By creating a baseline against which future assessments can be compared, scientists can track and ultimately predict changes in reef conditions. Every scientist had an opinion, every manager had an excuse, every conservation organization had an idea as to what should be done. But what we weren't doing were bringing all these disparate pieces of information into a, a solid long-term monitoring program. And it was the beginning of the EPA-funded water quality protection program through the Sanctuaries Authority. Initiated by a congressional mandate, the EPA Water Quality Protection Program first began in 1994. Understanding the impact that water quality has on the environment meant a need for understanding the health of the adjacent coral reefs. This was the context for the birth of the Coral Reef Monitoring Project. The Coral Monitoring Project looks at the change in coral coverage, live coral coverage, throughout the Florida Keys. They look to see whether there is an increase, a decrease, or no change of coral composition at different locations um, on a yearly basis. I'm a principal investigator on the NOAA and EPA Coral Reef Monitoring Project. And this monitoring project actually has a whole suite of different kinds of scientific investigations that occur simultaneously at the same place and every year through time. This is very important because these repeated measurements allow us to know how the reef changes. And then the scientific investigations that we undertake allow us to say why the reef is changing. In order to come up with a proper management or policy relating to the protection of these extraordinary environments, you have to have before data as well as after data. And the only way you know how much money is in the bank is to count it. And when we do this year after year, what this tells us is that the bank is losing money. There are two methods that we use. One is a very simple method. It's simply using a clipboard with a data form and going uh, into the water in, uh, in a set period of time in a, in a small area trying to find out how many different species of corals exist there. 
Since 1996, Jim Porter, Walt Jeff, and their team of researchers have diligently monitored the same 40 underwater sites from the Tortugas to Key Largo. By examining the same exact transect samples each year and meticulously recording every coral inhabitant, the team is able to take the pulse of the coral reefs. It's really important in these surveys to be certain that our data are accurate. And the way we do that is we have two investigators swimming each of these transect lines. And what we do at the end of our 15 minute timed swim is to uh, swim side by side and compare and contrast between the two lists. Anytime we see a discrepancy, we mark it on the slate and then we swim back through the transect line verifying the accuracy of the observation. The second thing we do is video uh, collecting of information on video transects. We uh, collect 20 uh, meter long transects. There are 12 per site and these are used to uh, evaluate coral cover uh, on the reefs. A custom designed video camera using laser calibration enables the photographer to capture all images equidistant from the coral surface. This technique aids the analysis process in the lab. Our video technology uses a digital video camera, so it takes very high quality imagery. Uh, this is taken back to our main laboratory in St. Petersburg and it's converted into uh, still images uh, and these are saved on a CD-ROM. So we have these in memory uh, and we can get back to them at any point in time. Using computer programs, the team can analyze the images and compare the changes from year to year. Uh, results have shown that by and large the coral cover has decreased since 1996 on virtually all the reefs. There's a few that haven't, but most of them have. And some of this is a result of disease, some is a result of hurricanes. So we have uh, a fairly accurate and very precise way of looking at how the coral cover changes over time, uh, how the species diversity or the different kinds of species that live on the reef change over time. And all of these are showing a trend of general decrease over the last few years. Uh, but in 1999, things got a little more stable. We saw a decline through 99, and in 2000 and 2001, it's more uh, uh, about the same for those two years. It hasn't changed uh, drastically or uh, dramatically, statistically. Arching southwest 220 miles from Miami to the Tortugas, the Florida Reef Tract has a variety of habitats. The most well-known areas are the striking high-relief spur and groove coral reefs. Up until the 1970s and early 80s, these areas of the Florida Keys reef tract had between 60 and 80 percent live coral coverage. By 1996, live coral only covered 11 percent of the high relief. And now, just six years later, in 2002, it's down to 7 percent. In the end of September of 1998, we had Hurricane George come through the area, and then we had Tropical Storm Mitch come through the area. Prior to that, we had the Groundhog Day storms. So you take these natural events, you combine those with whatever is happening with climate change, whether it's natural or whether it's human-induced, and then you combine that with what we're doing locally, and you can imagine why my hair has turned gray. In 1997-98, as Billy's hair turned gray, corals turned white. The once colorful corals were bleaching. Coral bleaching is when the symbiotic algae that lives in the coral tissue is released by the coral and no longer lives within the coral tissue. Um, this causes the coral to lose its color or pigmentation and it turns white. Coral bleaching usually happens when the coral is under stress in the environment relating to primarily to increased temperature and ultraviolet radiation. I see coral bleaching as kind of a signal that the coral health is declining, sort of like a fever in humans. While there were massive bleaching events in 1983 and 1990, the 1997-98 event was the largest coral bleaching event on record, killing an estimate of 16% of the reef corals worldwide in just a nine-month period. Incidentally, 1998 was the warmest year on record, going back 150 years. The Keys reefs were especially hard hit. Although bleached corals can live a few months without the symbiotic algae, 
If the stressful conditions persist, they may die. A death documented at many of the 40 sites by the monitoring team. There were two primary drops in the amount of live coral throughout that time series, and that occurred between 1997 and 1998, associated with a massive bleaching event, and then again between 1998 and 1999, when we know we had a lot of losses because of Hurricane George. Um, in the years that we didn't have a major environmental event, such as a hurricane or mass bleaching, the amount of live coral has stayed pretty stable. For optimists, the leveling off in the coral declines in the last three to four years is an encouraging sign. For pessimists, and for some realists, the corals are on borrowed time. All we are seeing is a pause, a pause in Mother Nature between this last coral bleaching event in 1998 and what will be coming again in the future. I'm just glad to see the level of coral diseases slowing down, not seeing the loss, the continued loss of, of more coral cover. We couldn't withstand another year like 1997 and 98 when we lost 35 percent of our shallow corals during those two stressful periods. As the Coral Reef Monitoring Project team collected their data, Jim Porter noticed something he had not seen before. The branching corals, especially the Elkhorn coral, had white lesions and were dying at alarming rates. At some reefs, they saw up to 98% mortality. They had found a new disease they called white pox. We took these corals with these little lesions and patches and we put them into aquaria. And lo and behold, even when all the predators, parrotfish and snails, were removed, the lesions continued to grow. And that was in 1997, and we spent the next four years trying to find out what was causing that coral tissue to die. Over the next three and a half years, Jim Porter and his senior researcher, Katie Patterson, performed many studies on the sick corals. Preliminary lab results showed that Serratia marcescens, a bacterium found in vertebrates digestive tract, was the causative agent of white pox. This was a huge discovery, potentially linking coral diseases with human waste, but the tests were only 95% accurate. Now, in science, 95% confidence is considered accurate. But in this case, I said, that's not good enough. We can't go to the public and say, well, it's fecal coliform bacteria, we think. So we spent another year and a half sequencing the RDNA so that we could be absolutely sure of the identification. And when we did that, lo and behold, the initial identification was correct, and it's a common fecal coliform bacterium. There was a possibility when we went into this that um, we were going to discover some new bacterium that was the cause of this. I mean, it's a, it's a coral, it's got, and it's an apparently new disease, that it would be something new to science. In fact, when it was identified and we started looking in the literature, uh, it was a bacterium that is pretty well described, and it is found in, in the, the guts of, of vertebrates, and it's also found in soil and water in various places. We don't know the source of the uh, serratia marcescens that was causing white pox disease. Um, that is really the, the question, the $99 question, that needs to be answered and for which funding should be provided uh, you know, as soon as possible. White pox was not the only disease that was present in the Keys Reefs. In fact, by the 1990s, there were over a dozen identified diseases affecting Keys corals. Resource managers, scientists, and locals like Greg Carollo were witnessing other disease outbreaks Keys-wide. In 1997, more funding was allocated, and through a cooperative effort by the US EPA, NOAA, and the National Park Service, a team of scientists and managers took to the waters. The new study was named the Coral Disease Survey and would complement the already successful Coral Reef Monitoring Project. The overall goal is to understand whether there's been an increase in coral disease. There has not been any baseline information in, as far as the distribution and frequency of coral disease. So we'd like to do that and also understand where there, 
whether there have been changes over the last um, probably four years that we've been studying it and to be able to relate it to different chemical and physical parameters to see if we might be able to correlate cause and effect. The Coral Disease Survey has established permanent stations that the researchers return to every year. Using scuba and occasionally snorkeling, they assess the frequency of the coral disease that occurs within a 113 meter square radius. We have not really seen a strong difference in the prevalence of coral diseases between the Upper Keys and other regions of the Keys, the Tortugas aside, because that seems to be a little lower, but in the, within the Keys themselves, the populated area. However, the Coral Reef Monitoring Project has found some uh, larger losses of coral cover in the Upper Keys than in other regions. In the Florida Keys, 16 different coral diseases have been recognized but only five disease causative agents have been identified. According to an extensive study conducted on almost 8,000 coral communities by Dr. Stephen Miller, these 16 diseases have infected 2% of the corals monitored. On the face of it, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but if it, if it were a human population, 1% is our definition of an epidemic. 1% and we're talking about double that number of corals that are infected with various kinds of diseases. If these were human beings, we would be up in arms and doing everything we possibly could to control that epidemic. So we have a very serious problem in our hands with regard to the prevalence of coral diseases in the Florida Keys. Corals are sessile, which means they do not move. So they are only as healthy as the water that passes over them. Therefore, the Coral Disease Survey Team collects water samples at each of their survey sites. We take water quality samples to be able to understand the physical and chemical properties of the water in the environment surrounding the corals of different health conditions. Through collecting water samples, the scientists hope to find clues to the causes of some of these diseases. However, even when they can pinpoint the responsible pathogen, scientists still need to determine the source of the pathogen. Even when scientists can identify the specific cause of a disease, such as white pox and, and its specific bacterium, we don't always know the source of, of the cause of the disease. In the case of Serratia marcescens, we know it's one of the most common bacteria on the planet. It's in soil, it's in water, it's in human waste, it's all over the place. And so one possible source might be human sewage, but we still don't know, we don't have the data that show the source of the bacterium that's causing white pox. And something that I've been arguing for uh, is more mechanistic study. Now this is often considered, uh, you know, in the rarefied airs of uh, science to be not relevant. And I'm trying to make the point that it is relevant because if we don't know the causes of these declines, then we can't come up with management solutions. Historically, disease appears to be more prevalent near human population centers. While no direct correlation has yet been proven, long-term, low-level stress from poor water quality, elevated water temperatures, and overfishing may make reef organisms more susceptible to disease some of which are only now being identified. With a complex ecosystem like the coral reefs, the possible stress factors are numerous. They range from local stressors, like wastewater, to regional stressors, like agricultural runoff, to global stressors, like rising ocean temperatures. With this multi-tiered, triple whammy threat, the resource managers have an unquestionably difficult task. Well, I think most reef scientists would agree that there are multiple causes of, of reef decline and of coral decline specifically. Um, it, at a given time when you go to the reef, you may see one or the other thing being sort of the most immediate cause, but it's really broad ranging and it can be from a local level of land use practices or uh, visitor impacts to a regional level of pollution or agriculture to the global level. And understanding how they all interact is extremely complex and is going to require a lot more research that is integrated across these various levels. On some issues, the Florida Keys resource manager's decisions are limited to what can be changed locally. 
While their data from surveys like the Coral Disease Survey and the Coral Reef Monitoring Project can alert regional and national officials to the catastrophic changes, the ability to influence global policy has proved difficult to achieve. When resource managers look at reefs in other regions of the world, they see similar stresses and problems. Fortunately for these foreign reefs, recovery rates from bleaching and disease have been much higher than Keys reefs. It seems that in other reefs, strong currents prevail and there is an upwelling in high waves that flush the reefs with clean, cool water. However, changing the Gulf Stream currents in water circulation is probably not the answer. We need people working at the local level to reduce all the local stresses. That's why it's so important for us to deal with the water quality, quantity, timing, and distribution coming out of the South Florida ecosystem. While we should be concerned about what's coming down the Mississippi River, while we need to be talking to farmers in, in middle America about their contribution to pollution in the Mississippi River, and that's why we need to be working with our colleagues all around the Caribbean Basin recognizing that we're the downstream end of what's happening off of Belize or Mexico, Cuba, and other areas. As our resource managers try to influence upstream communities, and as reputable scientists take steps toward understanding coral immunology, it is important that every single person contributes. Now, all of us know that improving how we treat wastewater is going to be expensive. But if you want paradise, you may have to take care of it to get it. Do coral reefs in the Florida Keys have a future? Will these colonies, some of which have existed for thousands of years, suddenly be gone? Will our grandchildren see live coral in the Keys? There is hope. Nature has a way of restoring itself, but right now nature needs to have us humans leave it alone. We need the natural conditions that favor the growth of these reefs in the first place to return to the Florida Keys. With great effort and resilience, scientists believe it is possible to reverse the trend of reef degradation. Globally, strict air pollution standards must be adopted, carbon dioxide emissions reduced, and renewable energy technologies employed to curb global warming trends. When we start getting the local, regional, and global vision, then I think we can all start getting to solutions. There are things that we can do at each one of those levels to address the demise of our coral reefs. Comprehensive coral reef protection will ultimately require proactive local steps, engaging leaders regionally, and influencing policy globally. One weak link in this chain of responsibility, and the corals will all soon be fossils.